iPhone 14 Pro, the highest end iPhone that money can buy. But is it really worth your money? Here's my two cents. But first, let's go somewhere more exciting. So I'm gonna address the elephant in the room already. I'm wearing a Broncos jacket, probably gonna get hate for it, but I really hope they win next Sunday at the Jags at Wembley, because I'm gonna be there, not at the game, unfortunately, but filming around it, trying to get that out of the room. Yes, that is dangerous. Mm. Jeez, that is dangerous. Anyway, onto the iPhone 14 Pro. Let's start off with the pros, no pun intended. First up, we have the display and the dynamic island. Quick disclaimer before I give my thoughts, I'm coming from a 12 Pro, so this is just my perspective on the 14 Pro. Firstly, this screen is unbelievably bright. In direct sunlight, it goes up to 2000 nits, which if you're not very familiar with the nits term like I wasn't, is unbelievably bright. First thing you'll notice straight away is 120 hertz. It is unbelievably good. I didn't think you needed 120 hertz on a phone. I got it on my monitors and on my MacBook. The 60 hertz looks absolutely disgusting in comparison. When you go directly from the 14 Pro and the 13 Pro as well to the 12 Pro, the difference is unbelievable. One of my family members has got a 14, uh, set up the 14, and just using their 14 was like, wow. This is, this looks so different to the 14 Pro, it's crazy. So 120 hertz is, is the first big upgrade that you'll get on this phone if you're coming from a 12 Pro. If you're coming through a 13 Pro, you'll already know what 120 hertz is like. It's fantastic. And we have to talk about the dynamic island. I'd have loved to be in that board meeting where they decided what they're gonna call this. They had to name it something. I just, I just thought it was great that they gave it a name. I will say the dynamic island yeah, it's pretty good. I wouldn't say it's a game changer. I wouldn't say it's unbelievably revolutionary. They've basically just packaged the notch down 30% smaller, moved it down on the screen, and they've given you a couple of millimeters of screen above the dynamic island, between the dynamic island and the edge of the phone where the earpiece is. I don't think you gain that much by getting this tiny little strip of screen between the island and the edge of the phone. In my opinion, when you're watching full screen video, which I like to do on my 12 and now my 14, when you're watching it on a 12 Pro, the difference doesn't look that bad. You know, the video just bends around the notch, whereas here it bends around the island, of course, but it's more distracting. The notch sort of blends into the top of the phone. This is like, wow, okay, the island is there. It's pretty big, but I'm pretty sure over time we'll get over it. The second thing I want to talk about is the cameras. It wouldn't be an Apple iPhone event if they didn't talk about the cameras for a ridiculous amount of time. And this year, they did it with good reason. This main camera here is now 48 megapixels and the size of the sensor is massive. It's absolutely huge in comparison to my 12 Pro and the actual camera module itself has gotten a lot bigger, even from the 13 Pro, which I thought was massive anyway. To show you the difference between 12 megapixels and 48 megapixels, here are some pictures that I took on raw files on both my 12 Pro and the 14 Pro. Now on the face value, if you're not zooming in, you probably won't be able to see that much difference. It's only when you crop in that you see the difference in the image. For example, here's a picture of my dog and he's sitting on the sofa and I took them side by side, one on my 12 Pro, one on my 14 Pro. It's only when you zoom in and you look at the detail on his nose where you see the 14 Pro has so much more detail than the 12 Pro. And the 12 Pro at 12 megapixels looks rubbish when you zoom right in. But on face value, when you're looking at a wide picture, you might not see that much difference. It's only when you zoom in and you go further and look for the details and you pixel peep. This main camera is now 1.78 aperture, which is great for low light, but also means you might be more likely to have slightly softer images because it's such a wide aperture, probably not gonna get everything in focus. It's very rare you'll actually ever go down to that f1.78 unless you're doing very, very low light photography, in which case this will be great. To be honest, I wasn't actually that interested in the 48 megapixels. What I was interested in was the stabilization mode, they call action mode on video. And I tried this out and did a side-by-side -side comparison with my 12 Pro, the 14 Pro, and my camera that I'm filming on right now, Panasonic GH5, on my DJI RS3 gimbal, which is their brand new gimbal stabilizer. So I understand this is a bit of a silly comparison, but after seeing the event where it was like a dramatic difference between having it off and having it on, I wanted to see how much the difference was. And carrying this on from the 12 Pro Max, it has the sensor shift stabilization, which basically moves the sensor around when you're moving the camera. So it should take away some 
of the wobbliness when you're running, walking, doing things where there's uneven ground, etc. So I'm gonna put all three of the shots up from my 12 Pro, the 14 Pro, and my mirrorless camera, and you should be able to see which one's which, but I'm not gonna tell you which one they are. So here are the three clips. Hopefully, you'll be able to tell between the three of them which one's the 12, which one's my actual camera, and which one's the 14 Pro. But in summary, you can definitely tell which one's the 12 Pro, and it's this one. The 12 Pro looks absolutely terrible in comparison. It's so wobbly, there's no sensor shift stabilization in the standard 12 Pro. It's all over the place. Every single one of my steps, I'm, the camera's flying up and down, it looks terrible. My camera is this one. It looks very, very stable, and it has a much higher image quality because it has a much bigger sensor in my camera than both the 12 Pro and the 14 Pro, which leaves this clip, which was the 14 Pro. I have two things to say about this mode. Firstly, the stabilization itself, absolutely sensational. Fantastic stabilization. The best I've definitely seen in a device like this. However, the actual image quality is a whole other topic. I don't think is that good. When you zoom right in and you, you look at them in isolation, stabilization is great, but the quality of the image is not so great. You can kind of see that it's like mostly out of focus. It's trying to track the subject, which was my neighbor. Uh, shout out to Tony, thanks for being in the video. You can see it's trying to track him, but it's also slightly out of focus. It's not really sharp anywhere. It's a little bit muzzed. Um, it doesn't it doesn't do it for me. I wouldn't use that, that clip to replace what I already have with my camera and gimbal. Now I understand the comparison's a little bit silly, etc. I know the comments are gonna be filled with, well, you're comparing a mirrorless camera and a stabilizer to a phone. What do you expect? I didn't know what to expect. That's why I did the comparison. And I'm impressed with the stabilization, very impressed with the stabilization on the 14 Pro. I just wouldn't use it to replace my current camera which is probably why I expect it anyway. But still, great for that stabilization. If you don't care about image quality, it's probably a great option for you. I will quickly mention the battery life. It's, it's pretty good. It's probably an hour or two hours longer than I was getting on my 12 Pro, and I've had my 12 Pro for two years on like 87, 88% battery health. And I was getting on average probably seven to eight hours of screen on time if I was really pushing it. But to be honest, I haven't really used it so much in isolation in one day. But if you're really careful and you're sat at home and you're on Wi-Fi the whole time, I genuinely think that you could get two days of battery life. If you stuck it on low power mode, push it down to 60 Hertz, you're on Wi-Fi, you're probably gonna be fine for two days, I think. And I'll briefly touch on performance, but what do you expect from an iPhone? It's absolutely rapid. The 12 Pro in comparison is still very, very quick. This is about 10, 15% quicker than the 12 Pro. Not a massive gain, but there's so much, there's only so much they can do. The final Pro that I want to talk about is crash detection. Crash detection is fantastic, and it's something that hopefully we never have to use. However, it's there if you need it. What I will say though, is that don't take it on a roller coaster or a theme park because there's been plenty of false triggers as you can see by this article. The acceleration and deceleration and the up and down nature of roller coasters have set off the crash detection resulting in the police turning up to theme parks. Maybe put your phone on airplane mode before you go on one of these. Now I've talked about the pros, now let's talk about some of the cons. First thing I want to say is that there is an, a few iOS 16 bugs. Here's a clip of one of the iOS 16 bugs that I found, which always happens in my car. Okay, so as you can hear, the music is coming out of my car. If I turn this up, you can hear it coming out of my car. And if I ask Siri to change the song, uh, this is what happens. Hey Siri, play uh, Vecan Back to Life. It came out of my phone speaker instead of coming out the car speaker. It's a very small glitch, but still something I thought no one else has highlighted yet. And to be honest, the only other bug that I found with iOS 16 is that when you're listening to an audio file that you've been sent in messages, if you swipe up, the island will expand with that audio file. It'll start playing for half a second, then it will stop, and then it will sort of fritz out because you can't play an audio file from messages whilst you're doing other things in the background. Apart from that, all of the animations for the Dynamic Island, fantastic. One of the other cons that I have is the always on display. This is gonna cause division. I don't like always on displays. I didn't like it on the Apple Watch Series 7. I felt like it drained battery life. And this has been a thing on Androids for years and it will show you the time and weather, whatever, whatever you can have. And it's only just come to iPhones. Hello, I'm filming a YouTube video. Bye, bye. Love it when that happens, an actual use of the iPhone 14 Pro. As I was saying, always on display. 
it's too bright. And I looked to actually set up an automation. I, I couldn't do it. You can't do it in, in the shortcuts where I, sit, where I would try and set up a shortcut to reduce the white point, which basically darkens the screen quite a lot. Because I thought the lowest setting of brightness on the, this phone and the 12 Pro is way too bright. So if you turn that on, it darkens it by even more. Little pro tip for you. If I could, I'd like to set something up where when the always on display comes on, the reduced white point would also come on, so it would be a much darker version of the always on display. But for me, it just hurts battery life. I know people say oh, it might not affect battery life. Having the screen on when it shouldn't be on is gonna affect battery life. I don't know if this actually counts as a con, but this phone and the 12 Pro struggle with this. Specifically on this phone, the earpiece is right at the very top of the phone. And sometimes in the little earpiece at the top of the phone, that's where dust has started to accumulate and I've had to get a paper clip or something or just try and get rid of the dust around that area because I feel like that's not gonna do the phone any good in the long run. The last con, is a pretty obvious one. This is not a cheap phone. This version is the 256 gigabyte version. It goes for 1,209 pounds. That is a lot of money. And to be honest, it's way too much for a phone. But that's where we are in 2022. Everything's very expensive. We're in an environment where this price is probably gonna be around, if not rise, in the next couple of years anyway. Interestingly though, in the US, the iPhone 14 Pro standard model stayed at 999, whereas in the UK and around the rest of the world, it's gone up by 100. And now I'm gonna throw in some extras, quick fire points that I thought were worth mentioning. First one is the 5G speed is rapid on this and it's a little bit faster with a new modem. Basically this little modem for 5G uses less power and delivers a higher speed range. That's all you need to know. Second thing to note is Face ID unlocks from a lot more positions than my 12 Pro did. I got it to unlock at a 90 degree angle, which on my 12 Pro just doesn't work. I don't know whether this came in for the 13 Pros, didn't get a 13 Pro, so I don't know. It's just something that I noticed. Another thing that I noticed was the design of the camera bump is significant. It's a lot bigger than the 12 Pro. If I have it on a flat surface, it will go up and down and you will hear it rattling on the table, which is a little bit annoying. It's also quite a bit thicker than the 12 Pro. I don't mind that if it gets a bigger battery in there, if you get more features, I don't really mind. I'm gonna talk about the colors because I really like this silver. When the iPhone 10 came out and that had this silver, it's a little bit darker silver, I think, than this. I love that silver. I didn't get the 10. I, I stayed on my 7 Plus for years until the 12 Pro. And this phone also has the tactile feel of a Pro device like the MacBook Pro and the iPad Pro. So my verdict, is the iPhone 14 Pro worth it? I would say yes, but only if you care about the cameras, the dynamic islands, and having the latest iPhone. The dynamic island and the software around that, like when it expands with calls and messages and music and whatever, that's cool, but it's not a massive game changer from anything like a 13, a 12, or even an iPhone 11. The things that you'll notice is the screen refresh rate, the battery life, and the cameras. If you care about those three things, you probably should get a 14 Pro. Otherwise, I'd still recommend a 12 Pro. I think that phone's great. I love using that phone. If I wasn't giving it to a family member, I would stick with my 12 Pro for the next two, three years. It's a great phone. So that is my review of the iPhone 14 Pro. Let me know what you think of the iPhone 14 Pro and if you're considering getting one and what feature you're most excited for on this phone. That's enough from me. I'm gonna go back inside before someone sees me in this uh, Broncos hoodie and gives me some abuse. That's right. <laughs>